Good afternoon and welcome to you all to today's online debate organized by the Foreign School of Banking and Finance on a very, let me say, technical in brackets topic, which is third party outsourcing risk, the role of board oversight. My name is Elena Carletti. I am a professor of finance at the Bocconi University. And I'm also the founding director of the Florent Bank uh, of FBF. And I'm non-executive director at Unicredit, where I chair the risk committee. So I'm personally very interested in understanding the role of the board in this type of risk. I will be sharing the debate today. So let me introduce the two speakers. We have James Fries, that is also the coordinator of the seminar. And he will actually, you will see that he will basically lead the discussion today. He has a career dedicated to promoting the integrity of the global financial markets. And he had the positions both in US regulators, the BIS, Deutsche Börse, and Weikart. And currently he's the founder of a market integrity solution and the chairman of Green Data, which is a FinTech startup offering a SaaS risk management solution for outsourcing by financial institutions. So he's very right on the topic of today's seminar. And then it's a pleasure to welcome for the first time in the World Academy series, Bernd Rummel. And he also has a long career dedicated to regulation and supervision and more from the public side, if we may say so entirely, at, at least so far from the public side. He is a senior policy expert at EBA, where he's responsible for the EBA work on capital governance, risk management, and the remuneration. And before that, he was at the Deutsche Bundesbank and Buffy. So thank you to both of you for being with us today. I really look forward to, to the discussion. But before we do this, let me allow to say a few words just for the sake of the more general uh, series that we are in today. So with today's event, we start again the activities of the Bank Board Academy for Non-Executive Director. I remind everybody that this is a new program or a relative new program that started in December, 2020 and include both a seminar series called the Challenges for Bank Board Members and the training activity, the first of which was held on the topic Better Check and Control of Risk last summer. In the next month, you will hear a lot from us in terms of the seminars. So we will have a, a new series of seminars, including the new fitter and proper guide of the SSM, digital transformation, cryptocurrencies, climate environment, and so on. And then we will also start with the training activities again in the spring with a new training on board governance. So please stay connected with us because we have lots of news to share with you and we very much hope you will participate. And now let me come back to today's seminar. We will spend the first more or less half an hour listening to our two speakers sort of teaching us the secrets of uh, outsourcing starting with the introduction and the background. And then we, the second part, we would very much like to engage in a discussion. We already have a number of questions that were posed to us during the registration phase, but please, all the participants, feel free to pose new questions in the Q&A chat box that you see in the bottom bar. And with this, let me now give the floor to James for the introduction of the topic, and then to Ben. And thank you again to both of you for being with us. Thank you very much, Elena. It's great to be here. Uh, welcome, everyone. So as uh, Elena said, what we'd like to do is I'll provide the introduction. I'll turn over to Bern to give an overview from the regulatory side. And then we're going to try to make things as practical as possible for you. Well, Elena said this issue uh, can be considered a technical topic. What we specifically are trying to do here today is not get into the technical details that are appropriate for managers and those with operational responsibilities, but really try to help you as board members understand first why we're doing this and, and here really relying on some of uh, Ben's perspective uh, from those who are creating the principles. Uh, and I will talk a little bit more about how I personally view it as a practical matter. And I do that from the perspective of someone who is a former regulator, spent the last seven years uh, with the Deutsche Börse Group, uh, so Europe's financial market infrastructures, actually implementing 
these rules, uh, among other regulations. So I can tell you based on experience of having to work them through in practice and now working uh, to help actually develop solutions for this. I also am trying to, while we're focused on the rules within the European Union, I will draw some examples based on regulatory practice in particular from the United States. And the one thing to understand in this context is that this is a global regulatory focus that is evolving very quickly now and is very different from the situation two decades ago when I worked at the BIS when we first started raising global awareness on aspects of operational risk fundamentally. Why? The reason is not so much a regulatory change. What you see in many jurisdiction is guidance, more details, but the factual change is the more important. The factual change that banks globally are relying more and more on external service providers to provide core services. So first, let me go to the question of what are we talking about when we use the term outsourcing? So this is taken from the text of the EBA guidelines, which Ben will introduce more, but in fundamental aspects, it's very broad. It's an arrangement. So generally a contractual uh, arrangement between a regulated entity, a financial institution also covers certain payments providers, whereby another party is providing a service. The most important component of this for you is the, the last bullet here, a service that would otherwise be undertaken by the institution itself. So this is very important for you to understand conceptually. The notion is this, historically, a bank would provide all aspects of banking intermediation. So between the saver and the borrower. But today you have more choices and those choices are largely in the use of information technology. So the financial industry, perhaps more than any other has been driven over generations by changes in information and communications technology. But this is not about cybersecurity. This is not technical in that sense. In addition to pure IT functions, such as questions of where do we store data, including in the, the cloud, which we'll talk about multiple times. It's also an aspect of what is generally referred to as white labeling. A lot of financial institutions today will offer different types of savings products, or it can be the movement away from traditional savings account for cash to additional investment products and securities or insurance type products, where again, that product is actually not managed or delivered by the financial institution. It's a type of white labeling where that financial institution uses its name or puts its name together with something that is offered by a service provider. So think of those two categories, the aspect of things core to the institution, as well as ancillary services, where you're relying more and more on external service providers. And again, in terms of categories, that could be your core accounting system from an outside service provider. There's really only a, a few that provide most services to most banks globally. It could be your transaction monitoring, your fraud monitoring, software systems. It could be your payments providers of very different types, wholesale as well as retail, how you execute those payments. Again, a core aspect related to the function of the, the bank. It could also be a lot of things that we refer to today in terms of fintechs, not the fintechs that are the disruptors who are taking business away from the bank, but the fintechs that are partnering with banks to bring more customers to them. 
the parties that provide the internet banking software, the apps on your telephone, a lot of those are not developed by the banks, but if those systems are not functioning, then your customers are not interacting with your banks. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about outsourcing. In fact, another way to think of it, when we talk about risks and risks in the connection to the global markets, and this is clear from the ABA guidelines, that one of the risks that we all face is that your energy or your electricity provider goes down and then our Zoom calls go out and, and we have no connection for activity. A bank is reliant on that and needs to consider that in terms of its operational risk, including backup functions, generators, but that's not a core business of banking. So that's not an outsourcing risk. It is a different operational risk. So again, think of the outsourcing as those things that the institution would uh, could do by itself. And that's why the fundamental aspect that I'm telling you is it's a choice to outsource. So when we go and we say, well, this is difficult, this is a challenge, you've made a choice to do that. And that's why when I, I come to this point, why does that matter? If you look on the right side, my circles there, that it, it's essentially a strategic choice what you outsource. And when you make that decision, you need to have the appropriate governance for it. That, that's what the regulators are telling you. It's about the operational risk management and the risks are different. We had a question that came in and it said, fundamentally, what are the basic risks when we talk about outsourcing? Well, the basic risks are that you don't have the same control if you're relying on an external party to provide something that you otherwise would do internally through your own teams, your own staff, your own resources. But that's basically what it is. And you need to think about how that works in the different contexts. And another thing is very important, I think for a board member to understand and think about their role is if we view this as too technical or get into the technical aspects that will be involved in the day-to-day -day managers in this area, we'll lose sight of the fact that it needs to be considered with many other areas of risk. It's ultimately about, like all other aspects of operational risk, continuity of operations, business continuity, related to, we'll mention a couple of times, resiliency resolution plans. But you should care about it because if your business is down, it impacts the revenue of the bank, it impacts your customers. As I mentioned earlier, it's not just about cybersecurity, uh, but that is a component um, and one of the risks that could lead to a disruption of your institution or your service providers. And often, again, we talk about it in data protection aspects, but think about it again. You don't have the same control over if you were providing these activities yourself through your institution. So you should also want to know on whom you are relying for that, not just for the, the service, but the aspect of the reputation, if you're white labeling a service for your customers, they are the ones that, that service provider that could cause problem with your customers or cause regulatory problems for you. That, those are the type of risks that we're talking about. So I hope that uh, sets the, the stage. And with that, I'd like to turn over to Ben. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, welcome also from my side. First of all, I want to speak a little bit about the status of the guidelines, just to set the scene, what EBA is doing. And we as EBA are, of course, a European regulator, uh, but we also look um, at the market developments. And whenever we see something which raises a concern, or if we have a specific mandate given by the legislator, we put out uh, guidelines. However, guidelines are not laws. They specify the requirements which are set in the capital requirements directors, and they are then afterwards implemented by the member states. And very often you find then the guidelines being implemented in laws or ordinances. So by this mechanism, they become more uh, binding. 
But just to jump back to the topic of uh, outsourcing, what we saw is, of course, that uh, there's for many, many banks that the business models and the way how you distribute your services uh, are, have changed. It's not only because of COVID that it changed, it's a trend that there was more and more outsourcing in particular uh, towards IT and fintech uh, firms. Um, that is, of course, to, easy to understand because the more use of outsourcing results from the need to be more efficient, cost effective, there's shorter time to market. So, uh, and due to that bigger use uh, by each and every firm, uh, we needed to specify how banks in the context of outsourcing should comply with the applicable requirements in terms of risk management, operational risk management, in terms of robust governance arrangements, what are the expectations, and in terms of an appropriate organization, but also with regard to other regulations and not the banking regulation, like GDPR aspects when it comes to the outsourcing, which involves uh, personal data. It's interesting when you look into the capital requirements directive and you look for the word outsourcing or outsource, you just find one reference, which is about the um, access rights to information for competent authorities. There isn't much in uh, with, on specific requirements. However, you will find very specific requirements on risk management, on operational risk management. And of course, all those requirements apply also in the context of outsourcing uh, certain processes or activities to other firms. When you look at the individual bank as regulators, we are of, of course also concerned about the well fair well-being of um, the individual firms, but more importantly, uh, we are worried about the functioning of the financial market in general. So we also see macro prudential drivers uh, why we put, and this is a driver why we put rules on outsourcing, which are quite uh, strict, because we see, of course, that there's a concentration of risks that has been distributed through uh, via uh, many banks in the past, which are now more and more concentrated at service providers. So you create like uh, big sources of operational risks. You have at the end swapped a uh, smaller operational risk of the individual bank to a concentration of operational risks at a service provider. And if there's a service provider failing, you have the loss of, for example, distribution channels, but also processing capacity to perform your business. There's the risk of data breaches. And if something material happens, of course, there's a contagion effect in case of operational risks and operational risk losses throughout the banking system. And that is why we need to keep those risks under control and have uh, specified our expectations on risk management in the guidelines. So we want, of course, also be able to supervise banks. And this is a real challenge when it comes to outsourcing, uh, because it's easy. The regulators and supervisors, which are then acting in line with our standards, which we send out, go to a bank and supervise. They now also need to look at service uh, providers, which makes it much difficult, more difficult in terms of having an effective audit. I understand also the other side. Service providers, of course, don't want that you have uh, every month a different uh, supervisor coming or a different firm coming and requesting an audit. So that is a real challenge on how to uh, coordinate. Uh, and we, I think, in the guidelines manage at need least to specify how to coordinate in the guidance between the different supervisors. Then there's an aspect which is not only the resolvability of banking groups. Of course, if you outsource intra-group uh, in a case of a resolution, but also in a case of restructuring, imagine if you want to sell a subsidiary, then intra-group outsourcing becomes quite difficult to manage because that part which is sold or which is resolved and may still exist afterwards uh, needs to rely on the service being provided by that intra-group firm or by someone else and changing outsourcing 
service providers in such a situation might be quite a challenge in terms of timing if you really have to go to another provider. That is why we apply the same strict requirements also in an intra-group uh, context. <clears throat> Overall, of course, as regulators, we are we want to keep the risks under control. The business decision as such, we are not making as a regulator. We are not giving guidance on what you should outsource or not outsource. That is a business decision. But we set, let's say, the red lines, what can be outsourced and what cannot be outsourced. And that's really important uh, to understand that and the guidelines are very clear on that, that you cannot outsource the whole bank basically to another service provider and have just a letterbox. Uh, so that isn't a bank. So you need to have a certain substance of staff and processes, uh, overseeing powers to be able to be authorized as a bank. And this clarification was very much needed also in the context of Brexit and the access to the European uh, market, of course. Could we go to the next slide, please? Just as a summary, and that is why I already mentioned, like the business decision is at the end for the firm. We mentioned that only very briefly in uh, the guideline that there's, of course, a decision to be taken and who should take the decision when it's very important to board. But we give more guidance on the process and on the contractual arrangements and in particular with a focus to ensure that banks can be supervised also on audit and access rights uh, about documentation requirements because if you enter into an outsourcing arrangement it's very hard to get out again uh, or to move it to another service provider and that is why it's very much important and we stress a lot uh, in the guidelines on the outsourcing process before it happens. So you need to look into is it how critical are the things I want to outsource? To whom am I giving it? Of course, as a bank, you want to protect your reputation as well. And there's now also the discussion about the social and governance factors. Of course, when you outsource, and we have put it already in the guidelines to a service provider in a third country, and then you have sub outsourcing to other countries, how is uh, how are human rights, for example, being protected? We very we often hear the argument, but it's a professional services being provided, of course, by professionals. There is no child labor, but those buildings are also cleaned. You have a kitchen, you have other services connected. So we want to make sure that the same standards are uh, met. And that is why we put those provisions into uh, the guidance. Um, once a decision is taken, of course, in line with the policies of uh, the bank, then you need to have a very clear contract. And you're absolutely right. We used arrangement because sometimes intra-group uh, outsourcing is not based on formal contracts, but on, at the end, it's contracts, uh, which is also clear having an advantage of being able to continue with a contractual arrangement, even intra-group, for example, if you sell a part of the group. So then it's all clearly um, structured and defined. It's very clear in terms of responsibilities. So what we shied away from putting a hard contractual, uh, uh, let's say, requirement into the guidelines, because much many of the industry said, yeah, but for intra-group, it's sometimes uh, diff different. Very important for us where audit and access rights, of course, as supervisor, we want to be able to go to a service provider, but that should also be in the abilities of a bank. Of course, there is a lot of coordination uh, done and needed. We have already had the first audits, joint audits of a handful of competent authorities together with the ECB going to big service providers. And um, this is quite a coordination exercise, in particular in times with COVID, it's a uh, mission really hard to, to achieve. It's, of course, very important that you monitor the service level agreements. Guidance are relatively short on that because we don't want to enter into too much detail on those uh, principles, we give high, more higher level principles. Of course, there should be monitoring, monitoring also of house internal, uh, bank internal concentrations. Like, do you use one service provider for the provision of many, many services has an impact on uh, the uh, risk which you are taking. Uh, 
also when you increase over time uh, the use of a certain service, it becomes more critical. And it's very important that we as supervisors, of course, will look also at the macroprudential concentration, which you as a bank uh, cannot uh, do. We give guidelines also on the exit. Of course, there must be the possibility to leave an arrangement, but in practical terms, this is very, very difficult. Uh, what is most concerning for supervisors is, of course, if you leave, you need to still have contractual powers to enforce that for a certain period, you continue to receive a good service by your old service provider. Because if you hand in the notice, the motivation might drop. <laughs> Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, um, so what is next? Uh, what comes up? There are two elements, and we will see how that develops in practice. So we will do, and we have started as regulators, to do reviews at service providers. It will be an interesting idea to develop that further, and for example, have joint reviews by competent authorities together, maybe with banking associations or external auditors, which are then paid by banks, so that we have one audit which covers like the effectiveness of service providers. This is an interesting point to, to investigate on how to achieve it, because that would reduce the, let's say, resistance of uh, service providers to agree to audit and access rights, when they are not need to be afraid that there will be an audit each and every month. We will have to set up a better system to identify concentration risks at the macro level. At the moment, all banks are required to document their outsourcing arrangements and to have a register in particular on critical um, outsourcing arrangements. We will look at those registers, of course, and try to identify uh, concentrations. But in the long run, I think a more like technical approach is needed. Uh, so we need possibly to have identifiers for the most common outsourcing uh, providers. So there will be more development. And uh, the more development is already coming at the end in terms of legal acts. You have the digital strategy of the European uh, Commission. And uh, as part of it, a digital Operational Resilience Act, which uh, requires banks with regard to their outsourcing, but also many other financial firms to implement uh, very specific requirements on ICT risk management. All those requirements are directed to the financial institutions. Then there will be an incident reporting, which is very important also for supervisors to be able to uh, follow up. There's a clear framework will be provided for testing of uh, IT systems. And there will be a very clear uh, written, written expectation to look uh, at all ICT risks at third party providers. So it's not any longer limited than to outsourcing with this act. It will affect each and every arrangement with an ICT uh, service provider. And under those act, ESMA, the other and EPA jointly will issue a whole set of uh, guidelines and standards to specify all those aspects. Ah, yeah, the human rights aspect, of course, it's too, uh, I see this question I may just answer it because I, we discussed that. Um, of course, as a regulator, we, we don't look, the supervisors uh, look, but the expectation is that they look, of course, into the contracts and that it is uh, managed, uh, that there's an obligation uh, for the service provider to not, for example, uh, employ child work, uh, that they have to respect human rights. So it needs to be part of the contract and that will be checked uh, by the uh, supervisor, however, it's also expected that the firm monitors, so it's a requirement on the bank to monitor it. So they will, they will have to have, for example, if there's an audit in the firm, they will have to look at are they really complying or it can be done by an external auditor. And supervisors, when they would do a, an audit, an on-site inspection would also look at those aspects because it's the value system of the European Union, which we also have to protect. <laughs> 
And I think I hand back to James. Thank you, Baron. So I hope that the audience has taken from that that this is something that's quite serious for the financial institutions. It is not an aspect that is a mere technical matter that can be left to management. Many of the technical details should be left to management. By, by this, you know, as we talk about, if you look at the guidelines or we look at the different governance structures within the member states, there can be different views between what is the role, especially of non-executive directors versus the management board of a company. But again, we'll focus a little bit more on the supervisory aspect. Denise, I don't think my um, slides are moving forward, so perhaps you can move it to forward for me. Thank you. So what I wanted to say here before we get into a little bit more practical debate is what we've heard is that the each choice to establish an outsourcing relationship is an important one. Each individual choice using some of Barron's words, some of the important principles that the decision to enter into that outsourcing is a long-term relationship. It's not like a securities trade with a counterpart that once it's settled, it's over. It could be a five, a 10-year relationship, even post-relationship. If you move to another service provider, you have transition aspect record keeping. So each individual choice should be taken very seriously when the bank decides not to insource to do it itself to rely on an external provider. But what I've listed here are just a couple thoughts that we're, we're already past that point conceptually. Individual banks may rely, depending on the size of the bank, the breadth of its activity on hundreds of external service providers directly and indirectly. So it's this volume aspect. And we can say that you should have detailed due diligence review of each and every one of these entities, as Baron emphasized, before you enter into that relationship, but then there's an ongoing monitoring type aspect. So you need to update your risk analysis, your decision, your cost benefit analysis. Does it still make sense to outsource this? A lot of institutions will do this as part of an annual review. But the risk of a disruption is something that happens in real time. The outage of systems for one day could have disastrous consequences for your customers and even impact your bottom line. So to wait for the next 12 months before a review cycle poses an, an ongoing challenge. We also have many detailed aspects in the guidelines about contracts, but let's be realistic here. If you're a relatively small bank and you're going to a service provider that provides a similar type of service for 1,000 banks, how much do you think you can actually change the contractual terms? You can spend months on this. Your internal, your external legal team can do that. But often in practice, it's just realistic. What was agreed on paper is filed away somewhere. And that's very different from the people who are operationally responsible with a service offering that can evolve over time. The aspect of subcontractors and sub outsourcing, one of the best practices is to say that I have made a decision to work with you, my counterpart, but you cannot sub outsource at least without giving me notice. And the question is, well, what do you do with objecting there? And what is the nature of that sub outsourcing? A, a classic aspect, and one of the reasons why cloud decisions are so integral to this discussion, but I think it's one of the best decisions to make sure that the cloud guidance is not separate from this outsourcing, can be illustrated by this very example. Banks have for decades relied on external software providers and, and start with the most basic aspects of 
the core system. Literally, that does your debits and credits in the banks, but it could be your risk management system. It could be some aspects of your transaction monitoring. If you go from an in-premise software license application, so you pay a license, you get a copy of the software, you install it on your own machines, and then you run it. Now you move from that in-premise installation to a cloud installation for a lot of reasons of efficiency. Then you're relying not just on the people who code that software, but you have network connections. They generally have a different hosting environment. And it could be different aspects of the, the hosting for how the application is run versus how the data related to that is stored or how it interacts with other data in your system. So that same surface that you had applied traditionally through an in-premise, meaning that you had someone else developing the license for you to run that software. Now you're relying on a hosted solution. You could have four or more different external parties needed to carry that out. So that means you have four potential parties that could fail rather than just one. And the other aspect as a practical matter, the practical challenge, you only have a contract with one of them. How do you enforce the decisions that are made by your direct counterpart with respect to their subcontractors? Another aspect is that it's one thing if you have a specialized service provider that is providing services to the financial industry and knows about some of these regulatory requirements. And part of it's working to help banks is to make sure they meet their regulatory requirements, be responsive to questions, be responsive to an aspect that the regulators might come and actually do a direct examination on them or the auditors of the bank may ask questions from them. If instead you're relying on a, in particular, technology provider that provides services to companies generally, such as a data hosting, they might not have the same familiarity or same interest in working closely with the banks. So again, it's an aspect of the different market situation. How much can you actually practically influence the offering or the responsiveness of this service provider? The cross-border aspects is, is interesting and perhaps one of the most controversial aspects of the guidance in practice, because in some ways it's leading to a concern that you're moving in a different direction from the globalization of the markets. IT, telecommunication in particular, some of the service providers, they really are less concerned about individual jurisdictions. They're offering a service that can be available or is similar. You have a market that for them is, is global. Think of the FinTech aspect that is providing direct services to customers or applications for your bank to provide direct services to customers anywhere in the world. They're less interested in this notion of a jurisdictional border. But the historical aspects of when we, when the regulators first part it, put out outsourcing guidance and guidance with respect to operational risk, they focused on, again, this contractual enforceability. And, and what do I mean by that? So as a, a lawyer, you can say that when I have provisions in a contract, this is the way I understand it in my national law. This is the way it can be enforced under my national law. There can be penalty provisions. As a practical matter, what are the things that you can enforce in a contract? There's really only two. One is that you can get money back, but if you actually ever read most of the contracts, with your outsourcing customers, basically the money that you can get back is often capped at the fees that you pay for that outsourcing services. Meaning that if you've had a failure and your bank has had a loss or that you've had disruption, all you get back is a limited price. It's not going to cover the losses 
to the bank. Almost no service provider will include that and it's very difficult to ensure this type of aspects. The other aspect that you can get is specific performance. But the problem is if the service provider is not able to deliver the service that you want, do you get a court to order them two years later that they should perform the service in a better way? That really doesn't help you either. So, so again, we can put all these things in the, the contracts, but as a practical matter, how much does it really help us? And again, I'm talking to you as that as a lawyer has actually negotiated these contracts just so that you really understand what the risks are here. There is a very different point as Baron uh, rightly emphasized that a, a global movement is for the supervisors to step in and exercise increasing national authority to go in and audit some of these individual supervisors and in some ways to impose penalties on them. That creates a different incentive for the supervisors to, I'm sorry, for the service providers to meet the bank standards. But that's not something that the bank can enforce directly. So it again is a challenge of the practical aspects of what banks can do. Another big aspect that drives the question of the cross-border is really data and the different in particular data protection standards. That's probably the biggest single differentiator that we have and a big difference in approach between the requirements on banks with respect to confidential data before we get to personal data and the approach of big tech companies and social networks whose very business model relies on collecting consumer data and using it for different purposes. So I hope that gives you a little bit of idea of, of why this can get complicated. Another aspect that I will say towards the end of the, the slide in terms of possible unintended consequences, what I fear in practice and one of the problems of now the increased focus on auditing, internal auditing, supervisor reviews, external auditors, even looking at service providers, we have hundreds of pages collectively of guidelines now as to best practices with outsourcing. As we've emphasized here, much of it is focused on the aspect of documentation, preparatory work to enter into an outsourcing relationship. It really takes a lot of resources there and it can lend itself to a checklist approach rather than stepping back and understanding what are the true fundamental risks that we have here in an institution and forgetting why we do this in the first place. And that's why I always come back to and, and start with the aspect of why we do this activity. All right, Nice, can you move? Jim, I'm sorry to, to interrupt, yes. but I'm afraid that we have only 15 minutes left. So yes. if we could maybe, in particular, go into the board the oversight. side. Yes, so go very quickly. So practical aspects for the board is in virtually all jurisdictions, they focus on the, the outsourcing requirements focus on critical activities. So while you may have hundreds of service providers, you do have ability to narrow them down to those that are critical or important. And that's something that a board should keep in mind. Um, next slide, please. There is this life cycle context and the, the first uh, top four aspects were from uh, Bern. There's also a diagram which I've reproduced here, which uh, comes from the US regulators, which I think illustrates it uh, a little better. But again, a problem is that it is very much focused on this documentation aspect. And that's why I've added my own part, this incidence. One of the most important aspects going forward and why I think the, the DORA, the digital, uh, Operational Resilience Act, the focus on resilience, is that incidents will happen no matter how much we focus on the preparatory side, you're going to have disruptions here. Let, let's step back for a second and we say this is about risk management, operational risk management, 
but look at credit risk management. Today, in according to uh, ECB data, about 3% of bank loans of the directly supervised institution are non-performing. So that's an example where banks have not ex have expected that loans would perform, but you still have a, an amount that goes bad. If you have hundreds of external relationships and you have 99% reliability expectation, you're still expecting that 1% of those are going to be disrupted over time. So you have to be realistic about this. And that's why it gets to a, a risk tolerance aspect for the board. Moving to the next slide. So here, where can a board focus and, and not get too much into the details of management? This is my personal advice to you. Certainly aspects of policies and procedures, similar to what you would do in other aspects of risk management. It would come up through a risk committee to approve. And here, it's very important to think of this again in the life cycle, not just the decision to outsource in the first place, but also the aspect of what do we do in terms of monitoring? Are we prepared for incidents? From a governance perspective, as the ABA guidelines are implemented into the member state regulation, there's some differences based on the individual jurisdiction, but there's often a concept as to whether you should have dedicated persons involved for this. So it's the executive's management's responsibility, but in some jurisdictions, it's effectively treated like a second line control function. So the same way that you will have a risk officer a chief information security officer or a bank information security officer come report to the board or a compliance officer report to the board, you will also expect to see the parties responsible for the operational risk management reporting to the board. In the same way you evaluate those other people, are they engaged with the business? Do they seem competent? Are they able to ask my questions? Do they understand this breadth of activity across the organization? That, that's the way that you should evaluate that from a governance perspective. R risk assessment and risk tolerance. Again, the decision to outsourcing is a choice and should involve a risk assessment, both on an individual basis, as well as with respect to the overall risks to the organization. As I mentioned, the aspect of criticality, a very regulatory definition of criticality is it could involve a significant loss to the bank. Well, think of that from a credit risk perspective or think of that from an M&A transaction. Many banks will have, not directly from the regulatory perspective, but as interpreted in their practice or even in their statutes, that something that could have a loss over a certain threshold is something that the board should be consulted on or even make a decision on. That's a similar approach as a best practice that you would have with respect to outsourcing. There's some smaller activities that the management will decide on, but if it's something so fundamental to the business of the bank, the decision to go to external providers versus internal providers and the risk of disruption, then those are aspects that might be uh, considered at the board level. It's frankly easier for you to do that because one of the regulatory requirements going in place uh, fully by the end of this year is that there needs to be a register of these top uh, service providers um, that is made available to the supervisors. So it's a good question whether you've seen that as a board member or whether it's been reported to you. And as part of that, it's again, not just the question of who is the direct contractual counterparty, but looking at these aspects, concentration, sub-outsourcers, and how, as a concept, they follow this through. It cannot be the, the board's job to look at each and every contract, to look at each and every potential sub-outsourcing risk. But you should know as a, a matter, if these are the important challenges to the banks, what is the framework in which they look at that? Just like any other issue, you will see audit findings especially because you will see increased auditing on this. So it's a question in your normal practice, how do you see 
follow-up. Um, and as you look at the reporting that comes through to the board members, most important aspect of annual reporting should be trends. If we are increasing the decisions of the bank factually to rely on external service providers, how do we view that risk as changing? And how do we review our regulatory or our response to the increased regulatory focus on this changing? So both the risk changing, what is our remediation efforts um, or mitigation efforts with respect to those risks? And again, if we expect incidents to happen, which is a probability we must expect, otherwise we're unrealistic. We're not doing real risk management if we say there will never be an incident here. The lessons learned from incidents are frankly much more valuable than any audit report because it's real life experience. So did we have a mistake with our assessment where our policies and our mitigation and our resilience and our um, business continuity plans, did we learn anything from them when we had a disruption of a critical service? So those are the type of questions that I would suggest for a board to ask. Let us open up for any other questions if we have. I don't see much more coming in from the chat right now. Okay, thank you very much to both of you. This was very interesting and very somehow also very pedagogical to what is outsourcing and why we should care about it and what the board should be doing. But maybe let's go back and focus the discussion that we don't have many minutes on again, the role of the board. So you are saying we should be very careful in the preparatory phase, but of course we can't possibly look at each contract the bank is doing because the, the volume, as you were saying, is huge. So how can we, at the same time, on the one hand, not look at each contract, on the other hand, be, I wouldn't say responsible, but try to challenge the management as to why they entered in this particular outsourcing contract. If we don't really look at each specific contract in the same way in which we don't, look at each specific loan that is underwritten by the bank. So it's a measure of principle, it's a measure of framework the bank should be have. Should we focus on a few contracts the bank starts? How should we think about it? So it is consistent with the board overall view to make sure that there's an appropriate framework, right? This is a category of risk management that is material to most institutions. And therefore, there, there should be a framework, including that governance in place. So governance doesn't reply to, apply to the risk committee who, who takes on this issue within the management and the board. What is the policy and the approach there? What I'm telling you is that in practice, though, to understand the operations of the bank, not in the detail, but really what's what's core to your banks and the strategy, the very question of what are the activities where we have a competitive advantage and we want to do internally versus those aspects where the bank does not have a competitive advantage. So we're going to rely on others, external service providers, external partners, which would fall within this outsourcing for the delivery of certain products and services. That's really a strategic aspect. So it should come up with the overall strategy of the company. And I do think it's important for a board to either, and this is really a choice within your practice, say that there are thresholds over which you have consultations. Or if you say that we have already a defined class of aspects that are critical, meaning that if something goes wrong, it has a negative impact to our institution, a serious negative impact, that it's only appropriate for you to have a discussion with some examples of that so that you really understand what is a practical risk here and then use that example to test your understanding of, well, they gave me a policy approach. They showed me the governance here. They showed me how we do ongoing monitoring of these risks. Do I feel comfortable that it makes sense with respect to these practical examples of what could go wrong? 
another thing we do in, in terms of some stress testing or incident exercises, it's not just about external defaults. You can also do that stress testing and incident exercises with respect to failures of your service providers. And as Baron alluded to, that is something that will be required in a way with, with Dora increasingly going forward in the future. Exactly. Of course, you will look okay. at the most important things first, uh, and you will get your operational risk reports with the events that happened that led to disruptions, and then it's the question how you follow up. Of course, there is some, if something really goes wrong, there's the need for follow up. It's more like overseeing the framework that it is appropriately managed. Of course, the board cannot look into each and everything. Okay, let me. Um... I'm really sorry that we are so short of time, but maybe let's take a few more minutes beyond the 2 p.m. We had sort of already thought that we could do this. So let me uh, let me focus on two aspects. The first one, I see that the burner would like to answer some questions in the chat, so I'll let you do it in a minute. But the second one is maybe let's look a little bit more at the intra-group outsourcing. So both from the holding company point of view and from the subsidiary point of view. So there were some questions, for example, the last one in the chat, how shall we think of outsourcing of, I mean, of a subsidiary versus the holding company that is not just a remuneration or other, but maybe processes and other outsourcing activities. And also from the holding company to set the subsidiary, for example, Bern was talking before in the case of resolution or in the case of sale of a subsidiary that then the holding company should be able to replace it. So let's focus on this two aspects and then we go to the question in the chat that Bernard would like to reply. I don't know, maybe Jim starts with the intergroup and then Bernard follows. Sure, so to be practical here, the factual circumstances will differ in terms of groups and how holding company versus subsidiary or affiliates work to, together. The question is, do you have aligned interest or the potential for divergent? interest here. And I'll give you an example on this. That there can be aspects where I'll call them administrative functions, but administrative functions can be aspects core to the uh, bank. So it's accounting systems, it's uh, risk management aspect, even some of the compliance aspects are done by a central entity or an affiliate on which the individual institution relies. If that's done as an administrative uh, matter for the benefit of the bank, and there's not other entities that are receiving the benefits of that service, it's hard to say that there would be a lack of alignment in the future. And even as Baron says, in a resolution type situation, you, you can work on a migration. If instead you have a situation where you're relying on one central party that provides services for a large number of different banks, let's say 10 different banks, and there's a disruption in that system, which bank do you prioritize on to move out of that disruption? It's a practical impossibility that you've made a decision to not have 10 different separate teams because it's more efficient and cost effective to have one centralized team, but that's when things are working well. When you have a disruption, you have this conflict of priorities, or you have the situation as Baron mentioned, if you were to sell off one of the subsidiaries, well, you can't also migrate that team with them because it's still supporting the other nine. That's something which you need to be aware of. And again, I, I use those two examples because it's a very different factual situation. It comes back to what I think is the most important aspect, the risk analysis and the risk tolerance. The board has to be aware of that and they must be comfortable with that situation, including that you don't have or you can have these potential conflicts. Karen? 
Yeah, I just want to add one practical consideration. We see in particular the attention of uh, supervisors in uh, smaller countries where you might have a bank, a subsidiary being located, which is important for that smaller market, Why it is not important for the banking group so much. So if you have a, a disruption, of course, the supervisor in this country is very much interested that the services are still provided because they're important for their market. And that is when you are a board member of such a subsidiary where you are important for the market, but just a smaller part of the group, then you need to be particularly aware that the supervisor will very clearly look at the robustness of uh, your outsourcing uh, arrangements into a group. And it still remains the case that even if you've outsourced the function, so this specific service, you at a minimum need someone within the dedicated management team internal to the bank who is looking at this risk management. So put another way, it's not appropriate for a bank management to say, I outsource this function to an affiliate and I also outsource all the risk assessment of this function to an affiliate. That's like saying, I'm relying on the salesperson of a service provider who tells me everything will always be perfect. Yeah, legally speaking, the CRD, of course, applies on an individual level. So each board has a responsibility for their bank, even if they're part of the group. And it becomes even more interesting when you think about the many cooperative banks and saving banks who rely on central service providers within the same institutional protection scheme, which is a different, like slightly different legal uh, setting. But uh, you have an extremely high risk concentration there. So there's also like the need, of course, to, to look at the risk, to look at business continuity uh, and how is it ensured by the service provider, but also by the bank. And, and I will say, I, I didn't go into that earlier, but in terms of, we talk more about challenges, but one of the, the greatest opportunities for solutions, which the regulators have increasingly welcomed is shared solutions here. Not so much at an injured group level, but shared audits, including through banking uh, associations or the ability to reasonably rely on others. And again, keep this in the context of every bank's risk will be slightly different and its risk tolerance decision should be different and individually, but the same service might be provided from one service provider to a hundred different banks. Is it efficient for each and every bank to do a separate audit, request all of the same information to go on site premise to ask some of the same questions in a different way it's clearly not so that's an aspect where reasonable reliance on shared approaches types of utilities cooperative approach including through aspects like these credit union provider organizations are a wave of the future Okay, let me give the word to Bern for uh, Bern. answering these questions. And then I've seen that there are some comments like we miss more coordination on DBA guidelines and outsourcing ICT continuity and the resolution requirement. Okay, I will make one, uh, take one uh, minute only on this. Uh, I think it's relatively easy first to, to tick off the SEPs things. The SEPs guidelines are repealed. They are not any longer enforced. We have updated it. Uh, we had the cloud recommendation and we integrated even the cloud recommendation to have one rule book on outsourcing, which applies to banks, but also investment firms. We technically need to update it just to make sure that it still applies to the bigger investment firms, which are under the investment firm directive because under MIFID, uh, ESMA would issue guidelines and has issued some general high-level guidelines on governance, but the same guidelines that apply for banks, of course, should also apply to the slightly bigger investment firms as they do for payment institutions and money uh, uh, e-money institutions. The coordination at the end with the BRD is a bit uh, tricky because it's uh, what you put in place in outsourcing arrangements, you, you, you uh, put in place in a going concern uh, situation. And uh, under the BRD, of course, uh, you have a completely different situation. So there's I don't really see how this can be uh, better aligned. For the future, of course, when you look 
at artificial intelligence and payment institutions, they are at the end very likely to be outsourcing. But this links also to the question on what is third party and what is outsourcing relation, uh, relationship. You need to assess really each and every arrangement. If it is like something like a credit rating, you would now do with artificial intelligence. Of course, a credit rating you would do as a bank yourself if you use artificial intelligence for that it's nothing else you would do that service yourself and when you do it on an ongoing basis then it is outsourcing if you just have a firm you buy the software you have it installed then you still have a third party relationship because you buy the software but it's not ongoing you use it yourself so you really need to look uh, at the two frameworks but the differentiation of rules between outsourcing and third party uh, relationships for the future with the DORA Act uh, becomes less and less important. At the end, you need to look at the risks also for third party relationships. And one other aspect of regulatory guidance and other jurisdictions with respect to the relationships comes back to what we've mentioned before that there can be different forms in which a relationship occurs, especially the example with intra-group relationship may be less formal than a clear contractual relationship with an entity that is deemed as a third-party service provider. So that's part of the reason why it's deliberately using language that can be broad here to not to exclude certain ones. But it is very true that there are aspects of overlap and requests for increase clarity as to some core terms where are the boundaries of relationships of outsourcing what is critical here and that ultimately is a, a challenge speaking as a former regulator and regulation generally they say put out principles don't be prescriptive and let us be risk-based well you can only do that if we use some broad terms and ask you to interpret them based on the risks and the specificities of your institution Maybe one final word. What should we do in case uh, the provider is not European but US based, for example? We touched a little bit before about this, but how can we ensure that the principle, the rules, uh, the GDPR uh, compliance uh, will be the same? What should the board do in that case? Should investigate the board? Should have a special attention on these type of providers? How should we think about it? Of course, it's part of the guidelines that you need to ensure the compliance with GDPR, which is very clear. And as a board, of course, you need to see, uh, speak with your legal team on how they ensure it and how they put it. You will not check each and every contract uh, again, but you need to be sure that there's a system in place that wherever you outsource data or the processing of data or holding of data, so all those uh, GDPR relevant issues, that there's a process in place that that ensures that the GDPR is put into the contract towards the service provider and that the compliance is checked. And this is really important because you are under the EU law, under the EU GDPR, and if you give it outside of the EU, it's even more at the end dangerous because you are still responsible to meet the requirements, even if the data is protest outside the EU. And you will have the legal consequences if you have data breaches. So this is really a big operational risk in terms of potential fines, but also about losing data on uh, your customers at the end, which is a competitive uh, disadvantage if it would happen. So I think there you really would need as a board member to look at very careful at the system in place to ensure that this is not happening. And I would also say that that discussion is best looked at from a GDPR perspective in terms of things like proportionality and purpose limitation. So to give you a very specific example where outsourcing can come up in that context, payment services. So if you're making payments on behalf of your customer, their request in US dollar, you will have a US entity involved, which will be subject to its own record keeping applications outside of the country. It should be part of your contractual aspects with your customer that you cannot process that at the request of the customer without providing data to an external provider. And that's something that's 
well established and understood within EU law going back 15 years before the establishment of the GDPR. Okay, I think we have gone 10 minutes of our time. I think we need to stop. Thank you very much to both of you. This is a topic that I think we we all should pay much more attention and we will apparently given the increased attention of the regulators. Maybe at some point we could go back to this topic in terms of more of ICT resilience and the cybersecurity because it's very much connected with it and with the transformation to digital and in particular outsource to cloud. Uh, this is becoming a, 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 even more important than it was before indeed. So maybe we can have an episode number two, more focus on the relation between outsourcing and cyber risk and the resilience. But for the moment, thank you to both of you and to all the participants. This webinar is going to be recorded. I mean, has been recorded and will be posted together with the others on a relevant web page within the Florence School of Banking and Finance. So for those of you that had to disconnect, you can find the rest of the seminar there or for those that didn't manage to be with us today. So let me thank you again and uh, let me say that we goodbye to the next episode of the outsourcing risk and cyber. Thank you very much again and bye bye to everyone. You're welcome.